A CPU is pretty useless without being able to communicate with other devices. That's why today we'll be adding memory mapped input output to our Logisim CPU. Hello everyone, my name is Mike and you're watching Polymath Unlimited. In this series we are building a Logisim simulation of an 8-bit CPU with the following design goals in mind. First, the CPU should be simple enough to make a physical build practical. Second, the CPU should be capable of complex operations. And third, the CPU should be easy to program. In the last episode we built an assembler for our CPU enabling us to write programs for the machine to run. In this episode, we will add memory mapped input and output to our computer. This will give our CPU a way to interact with the outside world, allowing us to run interactive programs. Before we do that though, there's actually another hardware bug we need to fix in the instruction decoder. Shout out to Gidsvids who found this bug and let me know about it. The way we built our control unit, the jump or no jump signals are active during all branch operations, including RSR operations. This is problematic because when we run the RSR instruction, the instruction decoder will also activate control lines as if it were doing a jump or no jump instruction in addition to any control lines activated as part of an RSR instruction. This results in undefined behavior during the RSR instruction, leading to the program execution sequence getting corrupted when the RSR instruction tries to execute. Luckily, there's a pretty easy way to fix this. We just need to add a single NOT gate and some third inputs to the jump and no jump AND gates in order to disable the jump and no jump instruction sequences while performing an RSR instruction. This allows the RSR instruction to function as intended. Thanks again to Gidsvids for pointing that bug out. If any of you find more hardware bugs, be sure to point them out to me so that I can fix them. With that fixed, we can move on to giving our computer access to I.O. devices. There's a couple of different approaches to I.O. Memory mapping is the approach that I chose to use here. Memory mapping is simply taking some kind of peripheral device and mapping it to somewhere in our computer's RAM space. This will mean that anytime our CPU wants to communicate with some kind of external device, it will simply be able to either read or write to the RAM address associated with that device. For example, we can map a keyboard to a certain memory address, and then whenever we want our computer to get input from the keyboard, we simply read from the address we mapped the keyboard to. If we want to send output to a console, we can simply map the console to another memory address. That way, writing to the console is as simple as writing to that memory address. In this video, we will be adding two I.O. devices to our computer, a keyboard and a teletype console display. Let's start by adding the teletype console. We'll drag one onto our Logisim circuit, and we'll change some of its attributes to make it bigger so it can hold more characters. Now we'll connect it to our data bus through some wire splitters. The weird wire splitter arrangement is necessary because, for some reason, Logisim's teletype console accepts 7 bit characters, not 8 bit characters. Once the data bus is connected, we can now wire up our address bus to a simple decoder to detect if we are writing to some address. For this computer, I'm going to map the console output to memory address FEFF. This is the RAM address immediately before the stack, right at the end of our usable RAM space. So this address probably won't really get used for anything else, hence why I chose it for this. If we write to address FEFF, then we will also write directly to the console by also connecting the memory mapped select line to the teletype display's clock input. When this signal goes from low to high, then whatever is on the address bus will get sent to the console. Let's also bring our reset button down closer to the RAM unit and connect it to the console's clear pin. And just like that, we have a console that we can write text to. Here's a Hello World program that I wrote. The program basically just loops through a string, in this case, Hello World, and copies characters from that string to the console. Let's assemble this program with the assembler we wrote last time and copy the resulting machine code into our Logisim RAM. 
If we run the program, we should see Hello World get printed out to the console. Being able to print text is all well and good, but in order to make truly interactive programs, we need some way to get input from a user. Let's add a keyboard now. We'll add a keyboard component to our Logisim circuit. Similarly to the teletype display, we can map our keyboard to an address. Here, I have mapped our keyboard so that if we read from address FE, FE, then we will read from the keyboard instead of from RAM. Note that in order to get the CPU to read from the keyboard instead of from RAM, I had to rearrange the glue logic for the RAM a bit to disable the RAM select line when reading from the keyboard. I also connected the keyboard output to the data bus via open collector NAND gates similarly to what I did with registers that need to selectively output to the bus. In order to write programs that use the keyboard, we need to understand how this component works. In Logisim, this component is basically just a buffer of characters that we can add to by typing characters on our keyboard. Whenever the keyboard's clock signal goes from 0 to 1, the oldest character in the buffer is consumed. The keyboard has two output signals a 7-bit character code representing the oldest character in its buffer, and an available signal that is 1 if there is at least one unconsumed character in the buffer. Here, I have combined the two in order to make a single 8-bit signal. This means that when we read from the keyboard, the highest bit of the byte we read will indicate if the keyboard was actually providing output or not. This simple program uses that fact to read from the keyboard, then see if we got a character or if the keyboard's buffer was empty. If it was not empty, then the highest bit will be set, and adding the immediate hex value 80 will result in a carry signal. If no carry was detected, then we start over and read from the keyboard again. If we did get a carry, then we'll simply write the byte we got from the keyboard to the console. Running this program gives us a simple typewriter interface where whatever we type on the keyboard shows up in the console. This program is surprisingly simple and compact, picking up only 14 bytes in RAM. Now that we have input and output capabilities, we can start writing some much more interesting programs. There are a couple more hardware improvements that I would like to make first though. Next episode, we will add a boot ROM to our CPU. This won't affect the behavior of the Logisim simulation much, but it will make it easier to store programs on our computer when we build it for real. Until then, feel free to play around in Logisim and see what you can create. Thank you for watching, and I will see you next time.